A revolution is an internal war. You've got one group that wants to destroy the constituted authority, to displace it, and to take over. So you have the war you must win, but if you just stop there, you've only gone halfway. You've torn down the old, but you haven't completed the revolution until you build up the new. Only in the United States did we have a successful revolution, the war of the revolution, and a successful building of a new nation. Being an American in 1776 is not what being an American today uh, would be. Uh, when people talked about their country, my country, they meant their state. Jefferson meant Virginia, John Adams meant Massachusetts. Uh, they talked about being Americans, but they did it the way um, an Englishman or a Frenchman today might talk about, I'm a European. Those Americans in 1777 created an agreement called the Articles of Confederation. In 1781, the separate states ratified the Articles and became the United States of America. In reality, though, the Articles only loosely bound the states together and barely increased the powers of the self-appointed Continental Congress. The Constitutional Convention would change all that by creating a strong central government that could tax, regulate trade, and deny states certain powers, such as the right to print paper money. If anyone in 1776, a decade earlier, had proposed such a strong, distant national government, uh, he would have been laughed off the continent. Here in Philadelphia's Independence Hall, in the same room that had seen the debate over the signing of the Declaration of Independence, the 55 delegates met through the entire summer of 1787. George Washington presided over the sessions. If to please the people, we offer what we ourselves disapprove, how can we afterwards defend our work? Let us raise a standard to which the wise and the honest can repair. George Washington at the Constitutional Convention. Guards were posted at the door the members of the convention took an oath that they would not reveal anything to the press outside. It was a secret convention through this whole period, but members of the convention said uh, we could never have done what we did if we'd been open to the public. The document the delegates drafted was only five pages long. Its first words, we the people of the United States, reflected the victory of the Federal Union over the rights of the individual states. Virginia's James Madison and younger colleagues drove the proceedings forward, but it was the very presence of the convention's president, George Washington, that shaped much of the document's content. All they had in, as a picture were governors and kings. They wanted a powerful commander-in-chief. They wanted someone who would be in charge of the army, and George Washington sitting up front as the president of the Constitutional Convention, the more they talked, the more they discussed this, they wanted this executive, and they didn't call it the president to begin with, they called it the, the executive, to look like and be like and act like George Washington. So they created it in the image of that man. When it came time for the delegates to sign the Constitution, its approval was uncertain. 81-year-old Benjamin Franklin took the floor. He made a speech which has become one of the classic rhetorical speeches in American history, arguing that they could sign it if each one of them realized that he was not infallible, that he would have to compromise, and most important, that it was the absolute best document that they could get at the time. I consent to this Constitution because I expect no better, and because I am not sure that it is not the best. I cannot help expressing a wish that every member of the convention who may still have objections to it would with me on this occasion doubt a little of his infallibility and to make manifest our unanimity, put his name to this instrument. Benjamin Franklin. Washington had presided over the entire convention seated in this chair. At the convention's successful conclusion, Franklin referred to the chair's ambiguous sun image. 
I have often looked at that behind the president without being able to tell whether it was rising or setting. But now, at length, I have the happiness to know that it is a rising and not a setting sun. Benjamin Franklin. The delegates took the signed constitution back to their respective states for ratification. The radical document prompted often fiery debate. But by May of 1790, two and a half years after the close of the Constitutional Convention, all 13 of the original colonies had accepted the new Constitution of the United States of America. Washington's greatest contribution to the founding of the country, to the establishment of the country, after the war, came in turning our Constitution into reality. The day that he took the oath as president, the day that our new nation came into existence under the Constitution, the entire executive body of the government consisted of two people, the president, Washington, and the vice president, John Adams. My movements to the chair of government will be accompanied by feelings not unlike those of a culprit who is going to his place of execution, George Washington, upon being elected president. He built the entire executive system that we know today. And in his um, first years as president, he created the defense establishment of America uh, that, by the way, exists intact here two centuries later. At the war's end, after seven years in the Continental Army, Joseph Plum Martin headed towards the main frontier. There he married, raised five children, and at age 70, wrote his memoirs of life in the Continental Army. He died just after his 90th birthday. Over 25,000 of the American soldiers who fought with him died in the Revolutionary War. Less than half the number of American soldiers that died in the undeclared Vietnam War. King George III ruled Britain for 60 years. He was a popular king. But late in life, a hereditary disease overwhelmed him, and George spent his last decade as a blind, deaf madman. France's revolution, inspired by the American Revolution, began in 1789. Louis XVI and Queen Marie Antoinette were guillotined in 1793. John Adams became the second president of the United States. His wife Abigail was the first woman to be accused of manipulating the power of the presidency from behind the scenes. Thomas Jefferson defeated Adams to become the third president of the United States. On July 4th, 1826, exactly 50 years after the signing of the Declaration of Independence, John Adams died. His last words were about his political rival. Thomas Jefferson still survives. Adams was wrong. Jefferson had died two hours earlier, on that same July 4th. Benjamin Franklin served as the head of the Pennsylvania Abolitionist Society. When he died, 20,000 attended his funeral in Philadelphia. It was the largest such ceremony America had ever seen. But his bitterness towards his loyalist son, William, extended beyond the grave through his will. The part he acted against me in the late war, which is of public notoriety, will account for my leaving him no more of an estate than he endeavored to deprive me of, Benjamin Franklin. Benedict Arnold and his wife Peggy Shippen moved to London after the war. He was never accepted in British society and died deeply in debt. In this little church, in a poor section of London, he and Peggy are buried. Their bodies lie behind this wall in a community vault. George Washington became the first president of the United States of America in 1789. He served for two terms, then voluntarily gave up power. 
setting a precedent that lasted until the 1940s. George III couldn't fathom Washington's decision to step down as president. Washington, who died before Martha, made a provision to free his many slaves upon her death. At age 67, he lay upon his deathbed, weakened by illness and the loss of blood caused by mistaken medical procedures. Just hours before his death, he knew the end was near. Doctor, I die hard, but I'm not afraid to go. I feel myself going. I thank you for your attention. You'd better not take any more trouble about me. But let me go off quietly. George Washington. Perhaps never in history did such a small group of leaders leave a more influential legacy. The American ideals of freedom and equality became beacons of hope and reasons for revolt to the oppressed of an entire world. The United States Constitution is still the undisputed law of the most powerful nation on earth. And the question about our experiment in self-government that Benjamin Franklin posed in this room during the Constitutional Convention is as intriguing today as it was 200 years ago. He answered it for his generation. Now it's our turn to ponder it. Is it a rising sun or a setting sun? <laughs>